Hey church and welcome. It is so good to have you with us. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we have an incredible experience lined up for you. Here's what's coming up at City Life Church over the next few weeks. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. And that's who we are. We are a praying church. Yep. Why not come and join us for a powerful time of prayer and worship this Tuesday, the 30th of July from 6 to 7 p.m. at our Lone Hill location. Pastor Nick and Pastor Bianca are super excited to be hosting yet another date night dinner for married couples right here at our Lonely location at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, the 1st of August. Here's Pastor Nick and Pastor B to tell us more about it. Hey, City Life Church. We want to remind you about something so, so important, and that is investing in your marriage. Amen. We're living at a time where the enemy is always after marriage because right. he knows if he can attack a marriage he can attack a family right. and so we want to have an opportunity to enrich your marriage with our upcoming date night that's right we are so excited for our next date night for married couples which will be on the 1st of august at 6 30 at our lone hill location we always have the absolute best time together <laughs> And we really want to focus um, on having our blessed life together, a wonderful life together, getting on with each other, being a team, building together, growing together, and loving together. So we really want you to join us for this amazing evening. Come on, why don't you register today? That's right. Register today at the info desk. We would love to see you there. Amen. That's right, for only 250 Rand per couple, you can make an awesome investment into your marriage. Please note that childcare will be available for 30 Rand per little person. Uh, and you can register for this event by emailing info at citylifechurch.co.za or popping by the welcome desk after the encounter. That's right. And a big shout out to all our City Kids families. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. <laughs> we have another City Kids family fun day and picnic coming up. We've got a wonderful day planned with games on the lawn, jumping castle, space painting, food on sale, and a special guest appearance by our very own Mr. Mr. Bear. Bear. It's going to be an incredibly special time. You don't want to miss it. So save the date. For our City Kids family fun day and picnic for Saturday, the 24th of August at 9 a.m. at our Lone Hill location. That's right. Well, that's all the church news we have for today. Have a great encounter. Bless Sunday. See you next time. Church, it's time for the offering. I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But before I get into it, let me give a quick background on it. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians. He's in Macedonia doing the Lord's work, preaching the gospel, going around and trying to get people to accept Jesus. And while he's in Macedonia, he notices and sees something so profound that he decides it needs to be a lesson to the church of the Corinthians. Writes them a special letter. I think Paul really liked writing letters, hey? I saw a meme somewhere that said, if Paul was to write a letter to the church today, what would he say? Oh man, I would love to read that letter. But he writes the letter to the Corinthians and he says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, they overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded, these are the Macedonian churches, the Christians. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Church, here is Paul writing to the Corinthians and saying, guys, you have not seen what the Macedonian church people have been doing. The way they have been giving. Take note. See what they're doing. He commends them 
And the thing is, at that time, the people were giving to the saints of Jerusalem who were in dire need because of poverty, because of wars, because of the things that had been going on. And they had got, um, the Apostle Paul had gone there, started preaching the word, and there was charity work that needed to be done. And he does this and he says, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian church. Paul takes note that church, there is the grace of God to be able and be willing to give. It's the grace of God to have an opportunity to be able to give, not only that, but to be willing to give. That is the grace of God. And he saw it with the Macedonian church. After that, he mentions that, wait, not only are they just giving, but take note that these people are living in poverty. They have seen trials and tribulations. They are in dire need themselves. They are probably going through what we would call an economic recession. They probably don't have enough for themselves to give. But listen, through that, they give like they've got more than enough. He says they are in such a lowly conviction, great affliction, and yet as the abundance of joy amidst them of the tribulation, the generosity and the quality of their giving. I'm thinking if I was part of the Macedonian churches, would I be part of those people that Paul writes about and says, oh my Jesus, they are going through so much, but they still give as though they have enough. Paul further on and says, I can testify. He's seen it. It's not something that he's hoping for. He sees it with his eyes and says, I bear witness to the way that they gave. They gave out of what they have and they gave beyond their own ability. Church, there's an ability that you can give out of your own budget, out of what you have. But there's a grace that comes from God where you give beyond what you are able to give. And that's what the Macedonians did. Furthermore, entirely of their own, without persuasion, without a sermon, without the music, without the band, they gave entirely of their own. To, to a point where they were imploring Paul and say, Paul, please allow us, give us the privilege to give. Allow us. Probably Paul going around is like, these people are begging and imploring me to come and give. Maybe you should keep a little for yourself. But no, imploring him, begging him to say, please give us an opportunity to partake of this charity work that you are doing. And the revelation church in that is that Paul realizes and says, the reason they were able to do that is because they had given themselves to the Lord. Not because of their own ability or anything. They had given themselves unto the Lord. Because church, when you give yourself to the Lord, the situation around you does not speak to your giving. What you're going through does not speak to how much you will give to God. Because you know and you understand that there's a greater giver who will sort out the situation. The situation you're in does not speak to the joy and the contentment you feel. Because those things are temporary. Those are seasons. They come and they go. But when you have given yourself to the Lord, you understand who your God is. Not only that, but you're also obedient to the things of the Lord. You are faithful in your tithing. You are generous in your giving. In each and every single way. May we be like the Macedonian church. May Paul write a letter about the church of city life. May he write a letter and say, Wow, I have seen the church of city life. And remember church, the church is not a building. It's us individually. It's one on one deciding that I will give according to not my situation but according to the God that I serve let's stand on our feet as we get ready to give there are different ways that we can give church we 
Oh, good morning, City Life Church. Come on. How are we doing this morning? Full of faith, full of praise. Come on. Our God is worthy. Our God is on the throne. He is worthy of the highest praise this morning in this house. Anyone grateful that we have a God in heaven who's already fighting our battles? He's already winning territory on your behalf. Come on. I'm so proud of a church that in the middle of winter, we are binding and plant here. Come on. It is cold today that in the middle of winter, there is a shout of praise. There is an encounter in this house. Never underestimate the power of of the worship that is released from this house. You know, Pastor Bianca and I have uh, uh, a couple in America that we're good friends with, uh, Brandon and Maggie, and we were in the States and they were telling us that um, at night, now listen, I'm not advocating uh, guns or or gun laws or anything like that, but uh, his wife heard a a noise in the night and she came downstairs and she's telling us that she took her cell phone with her. She went to check what the noise is, couldn't find anything, went outside, still nothing. She then phones her husband to let him know that it's just me, honey. Because he's a deep sleeper. Because in their household, that that guy, he says, you know what? I have a gun. Someone breaks into my property. I am armed and dangerous. Very different to how it is here in South Africa. But he said there is one gun that he has that he knows. It's a shotgun that if he's on this side of the door and a thief is on that side of the door, that if he cocks the trigger, that noise, that He says the sound alone is intimidating enough to make the person on the other side run away. Now I understand we don't have those kind of laws. We don't need guns because we got the Lord. Come on. But when he was saying that in that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to me right there and then and reminded me that it's the sound inside the house that tells the enemy on the outside of the house that you're messing with the wrong people. Hello. I want to tell you that when praise goes out from this house, the enemy is scattered. I will run to the house of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous, that's you and me, run into it and they are safe. Come on. I'm so grateful that my peace is found in the house. Come on. I'm so grateful that my joy is found in this house this morning. Father, right now, we ask, Father, Lord, I may have a sermon, but Lord, you have a word from heaven that we welcome you in this place, Holy Spirit. We thank you for a church that releases the sound of heaven into our community, the sound of heaven into our nation. I thank you, Lord, that the enemy knows not to mess with the people in this house that the enemy knows not to mess with this church. Because God, you are working miracles in this place. You are changing trajectories. We're blown away just by the sheer volume of people who came to know you as their Lord and Savior over the course of the last few weeks. It's miraculous, even during winter, that Lord, people would realize that the world has very little to offer. But it's you, Lord, who have the words of eternal life. Father, I thank you that the legacy of this church is not a person or a name, but it is the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, that this church will continue to be known as a place where the presence of God is encountered. We ask this this morning in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Fantastic. Can we give it up for our amazing worship team, our production team? Every single one of our volunteers who get up early, I want to tell you, they are here long before we are setting up for you and I to have an encounter with the Lord. Well, I want to speak to you a word this morning, and I was grappling with the title of my sermon yesterday, and I really, I didn't know how else to say it other than my title being, This Changes 
everything. This changes everything. I was thinking of some other titles and some titles that didn't work. The one was your but I just thought, like, I'm not sure that that's going to go down on a screen as a good title slide. But I want to speak to you today from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, where it speaks of the parable of the seed. I don't know if you've realized this, but never underestimate the power of a seed. Our thoughts are seed. Our words are are seed. Within seed is the power of breaking forth new life. There is something significant with seed, and Jesus gives us a prototype parable. This is the only parable we find in Scripture where Jesus gives an explanation of actually what a parable means. In other words, Jesus thought this message so important that he didn't want to leave it to chance that we would interpret this passage wrong. The parable of the seed is a prototype parable because of what it has to unlock in your life and my life today. When we read this parable, we read about a farmer who goes forth and he scatters seed. He sows some seed on thorny ground, some seed on rocky ground, and some seed on shallow ground. Did you ever see that only a fourth of the seed falls on good ground? <laughs> I want to tell you, even when I wasn't good ground, God was still sowing good seed in my life. Come on. Anyone get a witness with that? When I was on rocky ground, He was still sowing some good seed. Come on. When I was on shallow ground, my God in heaven still believed in me. He was still sowing good seed, whether I received it at that time or not, because the Father realizes the power of a miracle contained in a seed. See, seed changes everything. Seed is the secret to life. The secret to life is found in seed. I was chatting to a friend. He lives in another province in South Africa, and he was telling me about how he was bringing a testimony in his church. And his testimony was he had put out a photo of himself on social media. And there he was in a boardroom giving a, a discussion with his team. He'd recently been promoted to a position of a director. And everyone was commenting, Brew, you look so good. Who's the boss? Come on. You look amazing. Look at that incredible position you have. And he said, while people were noticing the picture of my stature, I was noticing and remembering what I had sown in faith. Because he said to me, you know what? And he was testifying. He'd had a learning disability. He hadn't had the resources to study. He thought that he would never break a cycle of poverty in his home. And here he was in this picture, not seeing himself as the position, but seeing the goodness of his God in that moment. And I want to tell you, as he's sharing this, he tells me there was a young lady in the auditorium who was struggling with her finances and said, you know what, I'm sowing today a seed into this because I'm trusting that I too will be in that place one day. And I want to tell you, he shared with me how that same woman was, was given a grant to study. She went on to work for in his company and she's going through the ranks all because of the power of a seed. You see, the world will tell you if you don't have enough, hoard it. The world will tell you if you don't have enough, keep it. The world will tell you if you don't have enough, store it. The kingdom says, if I don't have enough, it should go in the ground. Why? Because I'll put my seed in the hands of someone who knows how to multiply things. We have a God in heaven who understands the power of multiplication. If it falls short to meet the need, then it's meant to be seed. If it falls short in my life to meet a need, then I'm about to sow it into the ground as seed. What if I tell you today that the principle of seed can change your life forever? Church, you know what? 
In this house, we've preached a lot of things, but we care about you enough to teach you about a prototype parable that Jesus interpreted because he realized the potential of what you and I can release when we understand the miracle of seed. A little while ago, I went to a, a seminar and they were giving an instruction for counseling people that were dealing with substance addiction. And as they began their discussion, they were reiterating that substance addiction reverses actually a biblical principle that you and I are called to live. You see, addiction is not just listed as substance abuse. We can have addiction without being addicted to a substance. You see, addiction tells us to use people and love things. But when God comes, He reverses it and says, love people and use things. There is a difference in the kingdom. Whenever you are an addict, whenever you're addicted to it, you're about to elbow people on the corporate ladder, push people out the way, use people to meet your agenda. When they're no longer useful, you discard them. Those are the characteristics of an addict. And I believe today that there are people saying, well, I don't have an addiction problem. And I want to ask you, well, show me your credit card statement. Hello, come on. You're supposed to love people because God loves people. Your best resource, it's not your car. Hello. Your best resource is not the property or things that you own. Your best resource is people, relationships, and your family in Jesus' name. Let me substantiate this from the Word of God. There was a paralyzed man. He had very little. He had no legs, but he had four friends. You see, he had no legs, but he had four friends who had the faith to come and pick him up in his desperate place and take him to Jesus. You may not have things, but when you love people, God will place people in your life, in your position of paralysis that will carry you to the presence of the Lord. Come on. And it's amazing that when the four friends brought the paralyzed man to Jesus, Jesus didn't say to the paralyzed man, your faith has made you well. The, the, the true scripture says that when Jesus looked at the four friends, he says, your faith has made him well. I'm believing that when I don't have faith, I have relationship with people at City Life Church who will stand in faith with me. Come on. When I don't have hope, i got a family who will stand in hope with me. When I'm struggling to get out of praise, I have a family in the house of God who will bring a praise on my behalf. Come on. We're a church that loves people and will use things. Not, let's not get that wrong. Come on. See, the enemy wants to convince you that if you just had money, more money, everything's going to be okay. The enemy wants you to believe right now that right now where you're at, the reason why you're unhappy, the reason why things are not working out is because you have a money problem. Let me help you. You don't have a money problem. Because statistics will tell us, looking at this online, that 95% of people who win the lottery are broke within five years. 95%. That tells me that they didn't have a money problem. They had a mindset problem. Hello. They had a stewardship problem. They had an idolatry problem. Let me help you in your marriage. If you've got a problem with lust, marriage doesn't resolve your lust problem. If you've got a problem with idolatry, money will not resolve your idolatry problem. What it'll do is it'll magnify it. If you've got a lust problem before marriage, you're going to have a bigger problem in marriage. If you've got an idolatry problem, uh, a mindset before money, money will give you a magnification of your shortcoming when it comes to money. Come on. See, the Bible tells us that for you and I, there is the fruit of the Spirit. 
Things can't buy happiness. Things can't buy joy. They can make you feel exuberant in a moment, but they will not last. But love and joy are fruit of the Spirit. That means I can sow some seed and reap in joy. That means I can sow some seed and reap in love. That means I can sow seed and reap some peace in my life. Come on. I have met people with all the money in the world. The one thing they lack is peace because money is not the solution. Yeah, I want to encourage you that God has given you something greater as a child of God, and that's the principle of seed. Bible says, those who sow in tears will reap in joy. Are you with me this morning? The Bible says, those who sow in tears will reap in joy. That tells me that your tears are seed in the kingdom. That means that when you cry, you are casting seed in the kingdom of heaven. Come on. See that? How do I know that's true? Because I've met people who have a a dysfunctional relationship. They're still dating a high school sweetheart that's lost his way. And that girl is crying over the relationship that this guy, I've got to break up with him. The world will tell you that tears will resolve it. Let me help you. Tears will grow roots in it. And that's why you're bound still in that relationship. I had a girl at youth once come forward to the front, and she was crying. She was like, I want to break up with him, but I can't. I love him. And I said, stop right there. You're sowing seed, not just in tears. You're sowing seeds in your words, and that's why you're stuck with him. Let me back this up with Scripture. God says to the prophet Samuel, why are you still mourning over Saul, whom I have rejected? Come on. See, we need a revelation that God said that to the prophet. You know, don't need to go mourn over things that I've rejected in your life. The minute you're mourning over things that God's rejected, you're linking yourself into them because your tears are seed in the house of the Lord. When last did we cry over our lost brothers and sisters? When last did we cry over family members? When last did we cry for the nation of South Africa that, Lord, you would reach the the lost people, that God, you would bring revival, that God, you would bring reformation to our nation. What you sow in tears, you will reap in joy. Don't get that scripture wrong. Don't mourn over things that the Lord has rejected. Come on. Don't, mourn, don't sow tears and mourn over relationships that God doesn't want you part of anymore. See, there's three types of of giving when it comes to the house of God and the kingdom of God. The first time or the first type is spontaneous giving. Spontaneous giving is the kind of giving where you see a need and you give. You feel moved emotionally and you give. It's a valid type of giving. It's spontaneous giving. The second kind of giving that we read in Scripture is systematic giving. You see, there are some people who get stuck in spontaneous giving. These are the people who, after a great encounter, after a great service, they're like, oh man, I'm going to give something. Let me help you. That's tipping, not tithing. Ooh, it's going to get quiet in this place. Come on. <clears throat> Systematic giving is a principle of tithing. Tithing is not tipping God. Tithing is a tenth of our income that God calls us to. Tithing is stewarding. In other words, you're saying, God, everything I have belongs to you, but the tenth is is yours. In other words, I don't give my tithe. I pay my tithe because it already belongs to God. Come on. And you see, we kind of go from a justification place. I want to tell you that my wife and I, Pastor Bianca, we know what it's like to have little funds. We know what it's like in our life to have had very little, to be in a place where only one of us has been earning an income and we made a decision. You know what? We're going to honor God irrespective of our financial standing because our tithe is seed in the hands of a God who has the ability to multiply. It was was hard. 
It was tough. It wasn't easy. Let me help you. But amazing thing is when we paid our tithe, when we honored the Lord in the area of our finances, we had a knock at the door from the neighbors suddenly. Where were you? We didn't even know who you were. <laughs> and they're knocking on the door saying, hey man, we've got all this extra fruit and veg and everything else here. We don't know what to do with it. We just felt like, like hey, it's going to go off. Can we give it to you? And we were like, hallelujah. Let me help you in your place of need. Don't misinterpret that the Lord doesn't know your home address. Is there anyone in this house who has seen the provision of the Lord in tough times? Anyone give God praise that He's been faithful? I want to tell you, in a time where we had the least, we saw the hand of God the most because we honored the Lord with the resource that He'd given us. See, sometimes we come with a narrative. <clears throat> I'll tithe when I can afford it. Come on. You keep delaying the very thing that's going to move you forward in your finances. You see, your children may squander that which you leave to them, but they will never waste what you leave in them. Some of us have set an example, and I love that. I am blown away by our city kids that when they do an offering, I want to tell you, those kids are generous. That tells me in this church, we have some healthy families who are teaching your kids to steward well their pocket money and the resource and the finances that they're giving you, setting them up young that when they are older, they will not Depart from being faithful to the Lord. Can we give it up for some families? Can we give it up for some single parent homes? Come on. <clears throat> See, the tithe is holy. Come on. Oh, oh you know what, pastor? I'm going to tithe when I can afford it. Come on. No one in this church, but I've seen it before. It's like as soon as I can afford to tithe, I'm going to do it. And there they are with a Louis Vuitton bag and the, and the shoes. And I'm like, you got Louis money? <laughs> but you can't afford to pay the Lord what's due to him? Hello? And I know this is not a rah-rah amen, but it's the truth of the word of God this morning. Come on. See, a lot of people with a lot of money, but they still have a poverty mindset. Interesting, you speak to a guy at the robot, he'll tell you it's the people with the smallest, most irrelevant car who are always the most generous when they're standing at a robot. Come on. I remember hearing of, of a friend of mine, and he was telling me, my friend, um, he's in the music industry. He grew up in a rough home. Um, his father had been a drug addict for most of his life, and that because they were in the music industry, they were still earning good money and good income. And, and, and his father comes to a church service, and, and God just moves. Everyone, anyone have that moment where this person ain't never getting saved? <laughs> And suddenly God moves and that person put their hand up, they responded. And he began coming to church, began loving on the church, enjoying church. But the father was there, you know what? I like the worship. I like the preaching in the church. But ain't no chance I'm buying no pastor a new car. Come on. And I know that's the mindset of a lot of people, right? And his son heard this week after week after week. He's like, I love the preaching. I love the music. But you ain't going to see me giving nothing to that preacher. Come on. And the son eventually said to him, Dad, tell me this. When you were addicted to drugs, do you remember that season? He says, of course I do. The, the very part of your life that God has saved you from. And he said, I, I got to give thanks to praise to God for that. He says, tell me, the drug dealer you bought the drugs from, what car did he drive? And the man looked at him and he was like, he had a brand new car every time. And he said, do you not think that you finance that man's car? Hello. He's kind of like, do you not think? And he says, remember when you used to go to Santa and you used to buy a new outfit? You used to go out to the club, do worldly things, saying drinks on me. Why is it that you were a generous heathen, but now God is asking you to be faithful and generous in the church. And now you ain't got no money for nothing, people. Woo. <laughs> That very Sunday, the father began tithing at their church. Come on. That day, come on. See, those in the world, it's amazing. They find money for sin. They will find, they will live without. They'll do what it takes to find money. Have you noticed, some of you all who've got unsaved friends, right? I have never met someone who's out there smoking weed ever saying, 
hey man, the price of weed just got way too high. I'm just, I just can't afford it anymore. What is happening in this nation? What is happening in this country? I just got no more money for weed. They will find the money for weed. Don't like, act like you can't find the money to be obedient to your God. Woo. Redemption is coming to this house. Come on. Why do we talk about money at church? Why? Because actually as your pastor, I love you. Because actually I care about the people in this church. And actually because I want you to see that Jesus cares about your money. Come on. I'm talking about money because if your money is not free, you are not free. If you compartmentalize money as a separate part to your relationship with God, you are not free. Come on. See, being bad with money is a symptom that there's something wrong with how you steward and manage your entire life. God wants to bring a magnifying glass on that area because He loves you, because He cares for you. We say this often, this church, we're not trying to get something from you. We're trying to release kingdom principles to you into your life. Come on. We're not, let me help you. As your pastors, we are not trying to drive new cars. We are not trying to drive new Ferraris. That is not the heart of this church. We want the resource to do what God has laid on the heart for City Life Church to reach the people in this community. Hello, we're relying on you to be obedient what God's told you to do. See, our vision for this house far exceeds the income of this house. And I will happily, if you're saying, Pastor, I want to see the books, I will happily open the books of this church and you can see what our water bill is. You can see what our power bill is. You can see what our utilities, we're talking over a hundred and whatever thousand rand just on those little items, plus the maintenance, plus staffing, plus giving, plus Joseph Project, plus, 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 plus. We're not trying to get something from you. We're asking that in this house we honor what the Lord has asked us to do, to partner with Him and watch what God can do through this amazing church family. Come on. Woo. That's a good point. You can give the Lord a shout of praise. The first giving, spontaneous giving. The second, systematic giving, the tithe. Why? Have you ever asked yourself, why is tithing so important to the Lord? Let me help you. Are you going to base your whole theology on a clip of what one man said on a reel or YouTube video, or are you actually going to go and search the scriptures? Because let me help you. Tithing existed before the law. It was affirmed during the law. It was reestablished through the words of Jesus. When you give, in other words, when you give your tithe, and in the New Testament, a tenth was the base bottom line that they gave way over and above as Jen was sharing today. They gave in abundance because they had a vision for what was on God's heart. If I can be generous in the world, I'm going to be generous in the house of God. Come on. See, God gives us a percentage giving because it's not about just giving 10% and squandering the 90%. See, God wants you to practice, and this is helpful, a time of delayed gratification. That means if I go to the shops, I wasn't needing shoes. I wasn't looking at shoes. And now they got to buy two, get 10% off the first pair special. I ain't looking there because I'm going to buy shoes when I got the budget to buy shoes. Hello. Hello. Because it's delayed gratification. It's operating in percentages. There is a percentage for my home. This is why we offer courses on financial freedom in this house. We have an amazing financial freedom course to help people get out of debt at City Life Church. Hallelujah that we do that. Come on. Because actually God wants you to live free. Work on a proper budget. Every wealthy person that I've ever met lives their life in percentages. Percentage for home, percentage for the car, percentage for food. Too many of us are operating our households without even a budget. If you need help with budgeting, we got a course for that. Come on. Pastor Bianca and I, this week, Friday, were at our, our car 
car repair shop and Pastor B's got a great car and we've been able to maintain it. I think the, the most expensive service we've ever paid up until this week was three grand on her car. And it's a nice car because we found someone who's a believer, who's ethical, who actually cares, who actually doesn't want to rip people off, come on. And he's busy fixing the car. And I said to him, what's the most ridiculous price of a part? And he said, you know what? There was a young guy. He's still living at home. He's driving an M4. He came in here the other day and he was begging me, do I know anyone? And I don't want to get this name wrong. Do I know anyone that can sell me ceramic carbon discs for my BMW. And he said, you know what the price of a carbon, forgive me, a ceramic carbon disc for his BMW is, it's 65,000 rand per wheel. The man hasn't started saving for a home. The man hasn't put a budget aside for anything else in his life, but he's driving a car that if he replaces all of the brake pads, that's 260,000 rand. There's a lot of things you and I could do for the kingdom of God with 260,000 rand. I would far rather drive a cheaper car that I can afford to maintain and my kids get to eat, my kids get to go to school, I get to raise a, a, a fund for their university in Jesus' name. Hello. I thought I would get more amens for that. Come on. You don't replace the correct part on your BMW M4. You put generic parts and when you have an accident, they will tell you, you did not have the ceramic carbon discs that are part of the specification of your vehicle. Therefore, your car is not covered. Why position yourself in that place? Why put yourself under financial distress instead of just saying, you know what? I'm speaking some truth here today. It's going to get quiet. Lord, I want to be obedient. I want to be faithful and I want to be generous in your house because God, you've been so generous to me. Come on. I was dealing with a married couple. We're going to end in a few moments. The pressure's on. I can feel it. Just get me out of here. <laughs> I was with a married couple recently. Not that recently, a few years back. And this married couple, we'd, we'd kind of journeyed. I did their, their wedding ceremony only to find that six months into their wedding, she discovered that this guy had over 130,000 rand of debt that she wasn't aware of. I want to ask you in your marriages, be transparent. In our marriage, Bianca and I, we have a joint account. She can see what's going in and coming out. I can see what's going in and coming out. The reason why they were in trouble is because debt is not a sin, but hiding debt is a recipe for divorce. And I want to tell you that marriage never recovered. I'd love to share a, a redemptive testimony, but unfortunately the damage was too deep. God wants to see us set free in the area of our finances. In Isaiah 55 verse 10, it's going to be on the screen. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish. This is it. So that it yields what? Seed for the sower and bread for the eater. I want you to see that. Seed for the sower and bread for the eater. If you want to get on God's bread plan, eat everything that he puts in your life. Eat everything that the Lord provides. My money, every trend, everything you want, get it. You will always live on God's bread plan. But if you become a sower, God says he doesn't give bread to a sower. He gives seed to a sower. See, seed is smaller than bread. Bread is a finished product. Seed takes some ingenuity on your side. So you can take the seed, put it in the ground, harvest the seed, get the wheat, and manufacture the wheat. You have more bread than you will ever know what to do with it. Because seed will always produce more seed than bread will ever produce in your life. Faith requires you to see the seed over the bread. Come on. Mm. I want to be on God's seed time. Not bread alone. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone. 
There's something about releasing and understanding what seed is. My third and final point this morning is sacrificial giving. Sometimes God will lay it on our heart to sow a sacrificial seed that costs you something. It may mean, you know what, for a little while we're going to go without that part of the budget. We ain't eating out no more because God laid on our heart to sow a sacrificial seed. Something has to die in order to give God what he's asking us for. Come on. You know, if you look at a map of Israel, if you've ever seen, you've got, you've got the Jordan River. And the Jordan River flows into two seas. It flows into the Sea of Galilee, which you and I would know when we read about Jesus' ministry. He was regularly on the sea or walking around the Sea of Galilee. But the same river also flows into the Dead Sea. What's interesting is that everyone goes fishing on the Sea of Galilee. There's biodiversity. It's an abundance of fish. It's an abundance of life. But the Dead Sea is something like four times saltier than an ocean. Ain't nothing living in the Dead Sea. The same source, the same River Jordan goes into both seas. What's the difference? See, the Sea of Galilee has an outlet. The Sea of Galilee has water flowing in and it has water flowing out. God says, if I can get something through you, I will get something to you. God's saying this morning, would we have a revelation that actually God wants to give you seed, that God wants you to be set free from debt, that God wants you to live a life of abundance according to his word, but it changes our mindset that actually it starts with me. I need to stop pleading, I don't have enough, when Jesus says, I've given you more than enough. He's okay if you wanna live a bread life. He will, by the grace of God, he will give you a bread life. But there are people here today who will catch the revelation that Jesus explained this parable because seed will produce more seed. You will have more bread than what you could ever contain when you live in a place of giving, not just tipping God, not just symptomatic giving, not just systematic giving, but sacrificial giving. That's the kind of giving that moves the heart of God. Our worship team can come up. Church today, I am blown away by people in this house who earlier in this year when we had our robbery and and everything going down, that actually in that moment, they may not have had access to the resource there and then, but made the decision that actually this is my spiritual home. And over and above that which I tithe into this house, my family and I are willing to make a pledge, a sacrificial offering towards the sustaining of this house of worship. Because this church, not the preacher, Not me, this house that God has planted me in is worthy of my generosity. I believe in this house. I know I've rattled some people. The only time we get rattled is when we often place money above God. Jesus said, it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money. And God can help you, whatever. Let's say you get a lottery ticket and you win all the money in the world. That will not resolve mindsets that are framed and limited with a perception that actually money has you. God says, can you be like the Sea of Galilee? It's the same river coming in. But because there is an outlet, your life and your family will always be beaming with life. Can we stand up in this house this morning? Jesus said, a kernel of wheat doesn't fall to the ground just to be a single seed. If a kernel of wheat 
is just plucked and taken. It's just a single seed. But if it falls to the ground, it will die and produce many seeds. The reason that we are here today is because, let me help you, Jesus didn't tithe His blood. He didn't give just 10%. If Jesus tithed His blood, we would all be destined for hell. You see, He didn't stop at spontaneous giving. He didn't stop at systematic giving. Jesus went all the way as sacrificial giving to be a sacrificial example to all of us that He does not want you bound by poverty He does not want you bound by lack. He wants you to thrive, to live in abundance, to have the correct mindset of loving people and using things, not using people and loving money. God, today in this house, would you come and move by your Holy Spirit? I pray, confirm and affirm this word this morning. I thank you, God, that some of the greatest testimonies that have come through this church have been on the back of people that have had a revelation of the power of seed. And I pray even right now, God, that, Lord, you would release seed to the sower here today. For those that have been struggling in their finances, to those that are struggling with debt, I thank you, Father, that in Christ there is always a way out. There is always a way forward. I ask even right now, Father, for greater transparency in marriages concerning finances. If you need to have an awkward conversation, bring it to the table. I believe there is grace, I believe there's redemption, and I believe you as parents will set an example of what it means to be godly in the area of your resources to your children and to your children's children. Father, in this house today, I pray, Father, that we would hear not the voice of Nick, but the voice of your word. I pray, Father, that we wouldn't get offended, but, Lord, we would hold on to, God, what you are saying. I thank you, Lord, that those who have given, that those who have given sacrificially in this house, that, Father, you would continue to favor them. Why? Because they've got seed in the soil, God. I pray, Father, even right now, That, Lord, you would cause every person here at City Life Church to prosper in the area of their finances. That, Lord, you would give them a Christ-like mindset when it comes to that which you have given them. I thank you, Lord, that all we have is not ours, but it's yours. And, God, you have given us the ability to steward it. We're not going to dig a hole. We're not leaving it just to die but father we're going to use it to advance your kingdom and so father this morning in this house i thank you god for a revelation from your word of what it means to understand the power of a seed if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to jesus i want to give you an opportunity to respond He loves you. He cares about you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. If you're in this house and you've never invited Jesus into your heart, I want to give you an opportunity to respond right now. He is the way. He is the truth. And He is the life you've been looking for. Would you look to Him this morning? If you've been stuck with addiction, stuck in substance, stuck in substitute, this is a refreshing word. You can live for someone far greater than yourself who accepts you, loves you, and extends His grace to you. If that's you this morning and you're far from God, if you are honest with yourself, you are so far from God, I wanna give you an opportunity to respond today. Perhaps you did this a while ago, but today you're coming home. I'm gonna ask you if that's you, at the count of three, just to lift your hand up so I can include you in my prayer. Thank you at the front here. One, He loves you. Two, He has a plan for your life. And three, would you lift your hand up right now? 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can I ask you just to keep your hand up just for a moment, ma'am? Thank you. Is there anyone else in this house? Fantastic. We're going to pray this prayer all together. Lord Jesus, I come before you today and I ask you, Lord, to come into my life. I choose you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Forgive me of my sin, my past mistakes, and make me new. I choose to follow you from this day forward as my Lord and as my Savior. In Jesus' name. Can we give those three people a round of applause? Congratulations, congratulations, man. Congratulations, congratulations on the side here. Church, we're going to worship up a storm this week's Tuesday. Do not miss it. We would love to see you there. God bless. Have a great Sunday and we'll see you soon.